turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. We are in this passage in the very last section of Jesus's very last sermon in the last week of his life before his crucifixion. And what he does in this last sermon in his last week and what he does in this last section of that last sermon is to prepare us for what it is going to look like and what we should expect when he comes to earth again. He gets our hearts ready in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, and this is what God says. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we spend our lives thinking about trivial things that don't matter. We binge watch shows and fill up our hearts and our minds with worry about news events. We're in conflict at home and at work in our neighborhood about trivial, silly, foolish things. And Father, you have allowed us to come together in the presence and the power of your Spirit to put in front of our eyes and our mind eternal truths that will matter forever, that change hearts and lives and minds this moment, and the implications of that change will matter through forever. So Father, I pray that your Spirit that's here, the Spirit of Jesus, would overwhelm us with his power, with his presence, that we would see God, that we would see Christ, that we would see eternity and judgment and peace and love and joy in ways we never have before. Shock us with your power. Shock us with what you have for the human race. And I pray that you would do it now in Jesus' name. Amen. I have uh, told you from time to time stories about my memo, one of the most influential people in my life. She is uh, 
uh, about to turn 90. Uh, she's still with us. She is the uh, babysitter that my mom dropped me and my twin brother off at her house when we were about two weeks old and mom was going to go back to work and here was this woman who was going to babysit us and she babysat us and her grandkids and they called her mama so we called her mama and eventually she um, uh, stopped taking money and just the line between grandparent and babysitter dissolved and she was our family and she was and is the nicest, kindest, most gentle and loving woman I've ever met. And I want you to remember that when I tell you a story about her. We were at her house, me and the rabble of kids that she kept. Bad things always happened when we got together. Every day it was some sort of drama. And me and some of the other boys, we liked fire. Okay, if you're a kid in here, I'm confessing, I'm not boasting, don't, don't do what I did. We found some matches that Mema kept in the kitchen for what good and righteous purpose she had them for, I don't know, but we snagged them with some pieces of paper and we went out behind the wood pile. And we just started for fun, just lighting these pieces of paper on fire and we'd let it get as big as it could get before we couldn't hold it anymore and then we'd stamp it out. And it sort of turns into this contest. I'd try to keep mine going for a little longer, and then my buddy would try to keep his going, and then my brother would try to keep his going. And one thing led to another, and these fires kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We couldn't put it out, and somebody had the bright idea to just kick the flame on the other side of the fence. And when it hit the bushes and the leaves on the other side of the fence, it erupted into a big fire and we were scared. And us kids all ran into the house screaming, fire, fire, fire. And the house was full of some people. Mama and Papa were there. I don't know who all was there, but everybody hears this and they jump up. They come running out of the house. And this fire was getting pretty big. It was not anything that any one person could contain. Somebody tried to stretch the water hose out to where it was, but the yard was too big and it couldn't go far enough. Somebody, I don't know who the person was, came up with the enterprising idea of getting the water hose from the front faucet and bring it around. Somehow they were able to connect it and they got it there and the fire was extinguished. And listen, when all this was happening, my life was flashing before my eyes <laughs> and the fires went out and I felt a rush of peace like nothing I'd ever felt at that point in my life. But that feeling of peace was short-lived. Because when I looked up, Mama was coming at me in a way that communicated she believed the time for niceness had passed. <laughs> and the reason I knew she believed that time was over was because, do you guys know what a switch is? <laughs> is the, the statute of limitations has run out on this if you're inclined to be upset with what's coming next. But uh, a switch, for those of you who don't know, back in the good old days is a thin piece of wood that you would pick off a tree or a bush and it was used to correct children who light the backyard on fire. <laughs> so Mama was coming at me and she didn't even stop. She grabbed a switch off a tree while she was walking. She didn't even, she, she knew what she was doing. She didn't need to pause. She didn't need to slow down. She grabbed it while she was walking. The woman, I mean, this grown woman who now watches this sometimes, and if I'm lying, I'm dying. This dear sweet woman was wielding this switch like a Jedi Knight with a lightsaber. Vroom, vroom. I don't know what happened next. But when I came to and it was all over, the backyard was strewn with little children weeping and gnashing their teeth <laughs> who knew what judgment was. We live in a world of judgment. We live in a world where when you do something wrong, you're going to pay for it. Not all of you, we hope, light your backyards on fire and are switched over it, but all of us do things and receive judgment for them. Maybe you are 
listening this morning and you are aware that a pattern of dishonesty has led to an erosion of trust in your relationships and people just don't believe you anymore. Maybe you are here and a pattern of meanness and unkindness has led to a break in the relationships of people that you love the most and are closest to. Regardless, maybe it's, maybe it's a pattern of laziness at work that has you in trouble at your job or out of the job. We, we live in a world where bad behavior eventually leads to some kind of judgment. And the worst kind of judgment isn't the judgment that happens in this life. There is a judgment in the next life that comes to each one of us individually. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, the Bible says that it is appointed man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. It talks about this personal appearance before the God of heaven and earth, the living God, the judge that the Bible says is a consuming fire. Every single one of us, even if our sins escape judgment on this earth, will face a personal judgment with him at our death. This passage that I just read and Matthew chapter 25 is Jesus talking about a great and final judgment at the end of time. It's not the kind of judgment that you get for your sins in this life. It's not the kind of personal judgment that you experience when you die and face the Lord on your own. It is a global and a cataclysmic judgment. Revelation chapter 20 calls this judgment the great white throne judgment. It is the judgment that happens before the throne of Christ and is the final judgment at the very end of history before the beginning of eternity. The judgment here is described in spellbinding terms. Adjectives like glorious, describing the way the Son of Man comes in verse 31 and the kind of throne he has. There's this streaming glory at this judgment at the end of history. Angels are there. The, the sky is filled with angels and heavenly messengers that are flying around and helping to mediate this judgment. There's a throne which communicates not just glory, but authority and power. The Bible says in verse 33 that all the nations will be gathered before him. This is a cosmic time of judgment. One day your eyes will see this. One day you will be in front of all this glory and in front of all these angels experiencing all of this power and everybody you know and everybody you've never met will be gathered around that throne for judgment. This passage talks about that time of judgment as a time of separation. The separation happens and is talked about here as a separation of the sheep and the goats. Jesus is talking to people in the ancient world who knew what shepherding was like and who knew what sheep and goats were like. It was common in the ancient world for shepherds to let sheep and goats graze together. They'd be together in the herd. And if, you're, if you don't have a trained eye, you could walk by the herd and it's not immediately clear which are sheep and which are goats. They can look very, very similar. But a shepherd comes at the time of harvest and he needs to separate the sheep and the goats. While they're, while they're grazing, they can all eat the same grass. But at harvest time, we have to separate them because the wool of the sheep makes them much more valuable than the goats. And so we've got to get the valuable sheep, the precious sheep, separated from the herd so that they are different and separated from the goats. And the sheep in the story are placed on the right, which in the ancient world is understood as a place of honor and nobility and privilege. And the goats are placed on the left, which is a place of less honor, comparatively speaking. Jesus says 
This great judgment that's full of glory and angels and power and authority and all of the nations, this great separation is going to be like that. Everybody's living together in their life on earth now. And it's hard to tell when you look at the herd who's a sheep and who's a goat. But the shepherd knows. And the shepherd is coming. And he's coming to pull the sheep out and place them in a place of honor and to pull out the goats and to put them in a place of dishonor. This great separation, Jesus lets us know in these words, is moral, is surprising, and is eternal. Let's talk first about how this great separation is moral. In our world today, we live in a time of division. We live in a time where that division is full of rancor and nastiness. You you pick the kind of division. You pick the kind of way that we human beings separate ourselves. We divide ourselves up based on rich and poor. We divide ourselves up based on white and black. We divide ourselves up based on gay and straight. We divide ourselves up based on Democrat and Republican, blue state, red state. We divide ourselves up based on who is Young and who is not young. (laughs) We divide ourselves up based on east side and west side. All sorts of divisions. Jesus, on the last great day of human history, doesn't care about those divisions that we make up in our own minds and hearts. Jesus has a great separation that is based on morality, that is based on righteousness and unrighteousness. It's based on the good things you do or the good things you don't do. The people that he separates the sheep who go to the place of honor are characterized as doing good things in their life on earth. And the goats who are cast away are talked about as doing bad things on earth. The sheep, the moral group, live life not for themselves, but for the good of others and for the good of a righteous kingdom. And the goats, the immoral ones, live life for themselves. They overlook others. They overlook righteousness. The great separation is coming, and it is based on the morality of your life now. In Romans chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, it says that God will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. Your works matter. Your works are an investment in your eternity, either for good or ill. The works you're doing right now or not doing right now will one day get you onto one side of the great separation or onto the other, and you will be called righteous or you will be called unrighteous. The great 
separation is moral. But the great separation is also surprising. It's also surprising. I think if you talk to most people on the planet today and you say to them, how can you go to heaven? Or why do you think you'll go to heaven? Or do you think you should go to heaven? Most people are going to say, yes, I think I should go to heaven. Most people are going to say, yeah, I think I probably am going to heaven. And most people are going to explain why they're going to heaven based on their works, based on their own righteousness. It's going to be a relative, in most cases, expression of righteousness. People are going to say, I think I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I'm not out there like killing people. You know, I don't kick the dog. Uh, I've been around some other husbands and I'm not half as bad as some of those guys. So yeah, I think I'm a pretty good person. I think I'm going to heaven when I die. And the word on the street is that the Christian message totally disagrees with that. The word on the street is that Christians say, you don't go to heaven based on what you do, but you go to heaven based on what Jesus has done. And then you read the words of Jesus here. And Jesus doesn't sound like that here. It's surprising. Jesus says, okay, here are the good folks. Here are the moral folks. They're going over here with the sheep. And here are the bad folks. Here are the immoral folks. Here are the unrighteous folks. And they're going over here with the goats. And when you want to know the difference, it's because, well, these righteous people, these sheep, they did good things. They visited me in the hospital and they visited me in prison and they fed me when I was hungry and they gave me something to drink when I was thirsty. They did good things. And the bad people over here, the goats, they did bad things. They lived life for themselves. They were selfish. I was starving. They wouldn't even share anything with me. I was thirsty. Wouldn't give me a drop to drink. I was languishing in prison and they left me to rot. That sounds like The same kind of message that the world says. Do right, be a good person, and it'll all work out for you in the end. That can't be what Jesus is saying. Because Jesus knows what the Bible knows and what Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If I were to put before you today that if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be on the right side of that moral separation at the great last day, then what you got to do is work really hard to be a good person and you'll make it. And you would know by lunchtime that you can't do it if you have eyes to see it all because you're going to see your own sin between now and then very easily. And so how can the great separation be moral and be about your righteousness or unrighteousness when you are not righteous? Well, you have to remember what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus isn't talking about the entrance into the Christian life. He's not talking about the way you enter into a life of righteousness. He's talking about the final verdict. He's talking about the fruit that is visible from life after you've entered into that righteousness. Jesus doesn't think, the Bible doesn't think, I don't think, and you better not think that your ability to wind up on the right side of the moral separation is based on you and your works. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, listen to what the Bible says. Now, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. You can't get in by your righteousness and your own keeping of the law. And the Apostle Paul says, that's evident. 
You know why it's evident? Because all you have to do is look back over your life at the last 24 hours. And you're going to see you are not able to keep the law. Well, I don't know. My last 24 hours have been pretty good. I haven't hit anybody. I'm not sleeping around. I made breakfast for my husband. Didn't post anything nasty on Facebook. I'm doing pretty good. All right, what about this one? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Every last bit of you, constantly, all the time. Do that. Gotcha. Listen, it's evident that you can't do this. That no one is justified. That no one is justified by the law before God is evident for the righteous man shall live by faith. How do you get to be righteous? Jesus is looking at the fruit of righteousness, of lives changed, of lives turning from self and turning to others. But how do you get in? Jesus says, the righteous live by their faith. If ultimately you are going to live a moral life, you can't do it on your own. You can't do it trusting in your own strength. You can't do it trusting in your own righteousness because you don't have any. You have to have faith in Jesus. You have to have faith in Jesus who lives the life you can't live, who dies to pay the penalty you can't pay, and who rises from the grave in a victorious display of his own righteousness. And when you confess that you're not righteous, when you confess that he is, and when you place all of your trace in him, trust in him, he will make you righteous. And your life from then on will be about proving your righteousness as it comes to you through Christ and not through yourself. And so on that last great day, the people who are righteous are the people who are righteous in Christ, not in themselves. That's not the only thing that is surprising here. Another thing that's surprising about this righteousness and the righteousness of the morality is the person to whom the morality is done. At the end of time, there are going to be a lot of people who are surprised about what Jesus says makes them righteous. But if you're paying attention for the next two or three minutes, you won't be one of them. Jesus says, hey, you sheep, you're over here because you fed me. You gave me something to drink. You helped me when I was sick. You visited me when I was in prison. And they're surprised. They go, Jesus, uh, we never did that. You were in heaven. We were down here. And we never... We never did that. And the goats, you are over here unrighteous and immoral because you didn't visit me. You didn't come to see me in the hospital. You didn't help me when I was sick. You didn't give me anything to drink. You didn't give me anything to eat. You didn't do it. And they're going to, Jesus, that's not true. Believe us, you sitting on there with your glorious throne and all the power and the glory and the light and the angels streaming, we would have helped you. And what Jesus does to surprise us is he says, the way you serve Jesus is by serving the people of God. He makes this so clear in verse 40. The king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Jesus is talking about the people who are in his family. Jesus who are, is talking about brothers and sisters in the faith who love Jesus. Jesus here is expressing total identification with his people. When you repent of your sins and you trust in Jesus, you get folded into the body of Jesus and you are one of his people to such an extent that when the Apostle Paul is confronted by the living Christ on the road to Damascus after he's been beating up Christians and imprisoning Christians and killing Christians and Jesus Christ says from heaven, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Me. Jesus is saying, when you mess with my family, you mess with me. And when you bless 
my family. You bless me. That means every investment of your talents that you make in this church is less an investment in this church and is more, in the words of Jesus, an investment in Jesus himself. When you fund ministry in this church, you are writing a check to Jesus Christ. It might say First Baptist on it, but it's to Jesus. When your Sunday school takes up a collection to send students to camp, you're making that investment in Jesus. When you set up chairs on Wednesday night, you're giving Jesus a place to sit. Well, it looks like Jesus isn't in there. It looks like some uh, classes for the Holy Spirit and some classes for Philippians and some classes for gender. No, those, that's for Jesus. When you are kind to the person in this room who annoys you the most, you're being kind to Jesus. Listen to this. We're having some problems here. When you camp out and stake out your seat and refuse to let somebody have room to sit with their family, you shoved Jesus Christ out of your row. When you say, you know what, you sit here with your kids and I'm going to go sit in another spot, you gave Jesus a place to sit and worship. Jesus' identity with his people is total. What you do for the least of these, even the most annoying one in the room, you're doing it for me. That's a shocker. But now you don't have to be surprised on the last day. You can just know it's coming. The great separation is moral. The great separation is surprising. And the great separation is eternal. This great separation of the sheep and the goats, it, it takes a moment to separate them, but that separation lasts forever. Listen to what he says to those who have trusted in him and who have proved their trust in him over the course of a life of faithfulness spent relying on him. Verse 34, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's the end of history for all who have trusted in Jesus Christ. And you walk off with him into bright glory and righteousness and wonder and perfection and the credits on a sinful world start to roll and you never have to look at it again. He fills our hearts with hope that when you're living your life faithfully depending on the grace of Jesus manifesting the righteousness of Christ through your own obedience, it's not gonna be this way forever. He's filling our hearts with hope, with hope about a glorious reward that's awaiting each and every one of us who are depending on him. And then he fills our hearts with horror about everyone who isn't. Verse 41, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Get away from me. Banished, cursed, gone forever. Go to the same place where the devil and demons go. Go into a fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I said, one of my lessons about judgment happened when Mama got done with the switch. But the best lesson about judgment that day was the fire I set. Because that's the portrait that Jesus uses here of the judgment that is awaiting 
each and every person who doesn't trust in Jesus. But there's a difference between that fire in my mama's backyard and the fire in Matthew 25. The difference is we were able to extinguish the fire in Memo's backyard. And Jesus says the fire after the great separation is an eternal fire. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, the Bible says about those who are consigned to this eternal fire, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. The difference is the fire at Memo's house went out, and the fire at Memo's house had nobody in it. But this great fire after the great separation will never go out. And it will be full forever of the people who have not trusted in Jesus Christ. We have all these divisions. We have all these separations that we think so much about. Black, white, Democrat, Republican, red state, blue state, old, young, rich, poor. And we spend so much of our lives investing in those divisions. But no matter how important each one of them are, all of them have a term limit. All of them have a moment when they will cease to matter. They all expire. The separation Jesus talks about is the separation that begins to matter forever when all of the others are irrelevant. Some people with their human and temporary and earthly divisions, they lecture the world about being on the right side of history. But Jesus reminds us here that the dividing line in history only matters when history is over. And the dividing line is in history is Jesus himself, as he stands between the sheep and the goats, between those who are righteous because of their trust in Christ and those who are unrighteous because of their refusal. And those goats who refuse to trust in Jesus will find themselves forever to be on the wrong side of history. And all of us who have trusted in Jesus will find ourselves to be on the right side of history. Let's stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, you have been faithful to warn us again that the only thing that matters in life that has any ultimate value that is eternally precious is you and the righteousness you give to those who trust in you. I pray that you'd give the gift of faith in this room. I pray that you would, having given the gift of a warning, that you would spare from eternal judgment those who are seeking to live their life without you. Remind us in a world of petty divisions that the great separation is the one that matters. And fit us for it. Even now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.